Christ is risen. You know what? We can say that every Sunday. We can say that every day. Every day is Resurrection Sunday in the life of a believer, and every service is Resurrection Sunday service when it comes to the church. It's so good to see you again, to be back with you today. If you're joining us for the first time, I know that we have at least one visitor. I just want to uh, explain briefly. We're going through a series called Believe. Uh, it's based upon Randy Frazee's book called uh, Believe. It's really creative. Uh, and here's why. It's because it, it's unpacking the 10 core beliefs, the 10 core practices, and the 10 core virtues of the Christian life. It really is just the pathway of discipleship, and it's a great resource for discipling another person. I encourage you to pick up a copy, and we've been going through this series now for several weeks. We're actually coming in towards uh, the, the, the runway here about the land that's playing after many weeks of, of going through this series. Where we are today is that we're looking at the virtues of Christ, the, the virtues of the Christian life, and we're actually tackling two virtues today, goodness and kindness. Now, some of you are very concerned because, you know, I have a hard time finishing on time with one virtue, and so pray for me. Uh, we're we're going to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time, so if you take notes, you can always pick up a manuscript or watch the sermon later online. But we're, we're going to uh, just pray, and then we'll jump into it. Lord, we just ask this morning that your Holy Spirit fill this room. We thank you for this time of worship that we've had, declaring your goodness. You are a good Father, and you have saved us. And in, by virtue of you saving us, you have every intention of making us into your likeness, of recreating us from the old person to one who is new, reborn into your likeness, and in so doing, bringing hope to a hurting world. This morning, as we look at these virtues that belong to you, that you want to cultivate in us goodness and kindness, I pray that we would give ourselves some grace, but that we would aspire to be everything that you died for us to become, and we would shine brightly in a hurting culture. So give us grace, but also speak to us. Bring conviction as we gather together. In your name we pray, amen. So uh, my four subheadings this morning, defining the Christian virtue of goodness, defining the Christian virtue of kindness, a few thoughts on our culture's use of both of those words, and then finally, how we can practically cultivate these virtues of goodness and kindness in our lives. So when you think about uh, goodness, it, it really seems to be almost a synonymous to, to kindness. If you look it up in the dictionary, they actually serve as synonyms for one another. And I think it's one of the reasons that Randy Frazee uh, put them together, goodness and kindness. Uh, I think it's also, he just wanted to finish with 30 chapters instead of 31, all right? I'm going to write him a note, just say 31 next time is fine, I'll make it easier on us, but because I actually think these have very unique attributes, so we'll unpack them. First, let's look at goodness. You know, if you might recall, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 18, there's this great little uh, moment where a, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he asks the question that all of us are asking, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, like just give it to me straight, give me the plan, show me where the bar is, how can I be good enough? I just wanna make sure I'm good enough to get into heaven. And what does Jesus say in response to that? He says, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And he goes on, he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Now in this response, Jesus reveals a great deal about what goodness is, the ultimate sense of goodness. First, he makes it very clear what goodness is not. Goodness is not in the eye of the beholder. Goodness is not relative to my standard or society's standard. Goodness is not something that I can just work really hard to somehow accomplish on my own. Goodness is that which God defines in his word, that's why he quotes the law to him, and then God exhibits in his own character. Which means there is no independent virtue of goodness that can exist by which God can be judged or by which even human beings can be judged. Good belongs to God. This is a really important factor. 
Uh, you, you know, we'll hear people say, well, I don't believe God is good. Because, I mean, look at all the suffering and evil that's in the world. Clearly, God cannot be good. And when they do that, what they're saying is, I have this independent uh, concept of goodness, and I'm applying it to God. And what Jesus says is, there is no such thing. There's no such thing. There's no independent concept of goodness. There is God. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, right? Goodness belongs to God. You won't ever know any goodness apart from him. This is why uh, Frank Turek wrote a book called Stealing from God, where he says, you know, you atheists, you keep stealing things from God to try to prove that God is not there, that God is not worthy of our worship, right? But you can't apply good to God and say, well, I don't think, you know, God stands up to my, my, my concept of good. There is no good apart from God. That's exactly what Jesus is saying, all right? And because God is good, and because we bear God's image, that's what we find in, in Genesis, right? That God created us in his image. What we find is that there's a little bit of good in everybody. How many of you know there's a little bit of good in everybody? Even your kids. I mean, that's true. Uh, there's good in everybody. Even the person that irritates you the most, the most terrible enemy against Christianity, uh, wherever, the worst dictator in the world, there's good in everybody. And so we always say, well, you know, everyone's generally good, but that's not what I'm saying. But there is some good in all of us because we bear God's image. That's why we're moral creatures, right? But Jesus makes it clear. According to a biblical worldview, there's no such thing as a good person in the natural state. Which is why we don't believe, like every other religion in the world does, that good people go to heaven. That, that's an impossible concept within a Christian worldview. That's why Jesus immediately stops the man right there and says, why do you call me good? Jesus actually qualified as good, but he's trying to make a point. And you know what the young man does? He says, I've done all these things my whole life. I'm good. He missed the point completely, which is why Jesus says, yeah, just one more thing. Just go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then follow me. And he, he just reveals his idolatrous heart. So this is really an important concept. I want you to really start where it begins, and that is God is good. Goodness belongs to God. We're not good. There's good in us, but we'll never be good enough. And so the virtue of goodness is not something that we just try very, very hard to accomplish. It begins when we are saved. It begins when we admit our lack of goodness, we surrender to Christ, we're saved by grace, the old man is dead, and the new man is born. This is why Jesus says you must be born again. This new reality of one who is saved begins to grow and develop and cultivate the virtue of goodness because it's the I but not I. I have been crucified in Christ, says Paul, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is the source of our goodness. It is the imprint of the character of God that now begins to be revealed and cultivated in our lives. So, this just how I wrote it, when Christ lives in us, as our thinking and our habits are conformed to his, we will not only do good, but over time we will exhibit the virtue of goodness, which is to say that our speech and conduct will more and more reflect God's character. I believe this is really the essence of Christian goodness. So what does that look like? You know exactly what it looks like. If you've ever read the four Gospels, you will know exactly what the virtue of goodness looks like. It looks like Jesus. Constantly, everything Jesus said and did was good. It, it, it was constantly consistent and revealed the very character of God. So if we're Jesus' followers, if we're being redeemed and sanctified by Christ in us, these very virtues of the character of God will, over time, become our virtues. We'll become the way that we think, the way we talk, the way we treat people, what we do, right? So uh, turn again to Matthew 12. This is another great little story that reveals some elements of goodness. Uh, Jesus had just, just cast out a demon from this poor guy who, who had been struggling with a demon for years, and his opponents, the Pharisees and the scribes, say, yeah, but I think he cast out that demon by invoking the prince of demons, Beelzebub. That is not a good thing to say to Jesus, all right? That, that did not go over well with him. Uh, he gets a little fired up in his response, but in his response, he once again gives us a, a, an insight into this concept of goodness. Here's what he says in verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. 
You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil, I tell you. On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak, and for by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. That's a very powerful, very strong response. They deserved it. But it is something that we need to look into quite quite seriously. Here's what he just said. He equates the goodness, this virtue of goodness, is the fruit of a good tree. If the tree is good in its core, then its goodness will become evident in the produce thereof, right? And what it produces. If the tree is bad, its fruit will inevitably betray that reality as well. You can't hide it. It'll be obvious. So the virtue of goodness is an overflow of who we are and who we're we're becoming. Goodness will lead to good works. As we practice good works, our goodness will increase, but ultimately, the virtue of goodness is an overflow of what's happening within us. Now note also that Jesus measures goodness. Goodness will be revealed in what comes out of our mouths. I mean, this is very daunting, isn't it? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. On the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Words matter. They matter a lot. Proverbs 12, 18 reads, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts but the words of the wise bring healing. Make no mistake, this huge number of suicides that are happening in our country, oftentimes amongst middle school students, which has increased 30%. Yeah, you ever heard eighth grade girls talk to each other, talk about each other, right? Words matter. Words can be very, very destructive. They're like sword thrusts. This is still true, and it's even more true now as we carelessly throw words out there in social media and so on. Uh, it's a big deal. James 3 writes, the, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. How many of you know that's true? It's a big deal. And he deals with the tension that we find within the church. He says, with our tongues, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? This is a big deal. Clearly, goodness can and will always be revealed by our words. If we're growing in the virtue of goodness, it will be evident in what we say and what we don't say. If the virtue of goodness is, is growing in us, our words will more and more reflect the character of God. But if your words don't reflect the character of God, if they misrepresent the character of God, then we must question the progress of the virtue of goodness in us. It, it will be revealed in what we say. That's a very important point, and Jesus makes it strongly. Now, our goodness will also be apparent by what we do or what we don't do, right? Matthew 23, turn your Bibles. Matthew 23, once again, he's kind of in it with uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, and he uh, says in, in verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses, and so do and observe whatever they tell you but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Lord have mercy that he would never say that about any of us or any pastor or Christian leader, but hey, let's just be honest. There are many religious people who are very gifted with words. They can give all the right answers, and they do nothing. Or whatever they do, they make sure that you see it so that you can applaud them and give them a pat on the back and and just tell them how great they are. Jesus says, "Don't, don't don't even go there. Don't follow those people. Yeah, you can, you can honor their teaching. The teaching's good. Go do what the Bible says, but don't do what they do. Don't live like that. 
I am sorry to say I've seen this my whole life. Um, sometimes I see it in myself. You know, we, you, you find people who are so eloquent in calling people to reach the lost, but then they do nothing to reach the lost. They cast vision that somebody should help the poor, but not them. They believe somebody should be out there fighting injustice, but they do nothing to fight injustice. So many religious people know the Bible inside and out, and yet they do nothing. These are the very same religious people who reinforce the stereotype of Christian hypocrites that drives away the next generation from the church. Trust me, if you were doing nothing good, there is no virtue of goodness in you. It is very clear, goodness will bear fruit that is measurable, obvious, and virtuous. So church, take a moment, inventory your life. Think about the way that you spend your time, your money, and your very best energy. Think about last week or last month, last year. Would a casual observer be able to see within you the goodness of God? Would they see his character in what you're doing, in what you've done, in what you've sacrificed, and how you've lived your life? Now, even more than a list of good deeds that we might mount up and accomplish, this virtue of goodness is also indicated by the absence of evil in our motives, speech, and actions. Remember, evil, when it comes to our behavior, is really, it's a parasite. Evil attaches itself onto something good and corrupts it, trying to make it either an ultimate thing or, or corrupts it into something that gives us great pride and so on. If you've not read Screw Tape Letters, you really need to by C.S. Lewis because that's what the whole book is about. But if the parasite of evil is being removed from our lives through the grace of Jesus Christ, then what should remain is more and more goodness, and that goodness is unhindered, and it will bear fruit. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Colossae. He's writing to a bunch of pagans who have become believers. They're new believers. He's writing to them in Colossians 3. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. You hear that language? You've died. The old you is dead. And your life is hidden now with Christ and God. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Covetous, say that three times really fast. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouths. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Do you hear that language? So the virtue of goodness is not just the good deeds that we do. It's putting to death the intentional evil, this, this accommodation of evil in our lives that most of us, unless somebody points it out to you, you don't really even realize that you're doing it. But we do. I mean, I want you to think about what you read, what you listen to, what you watch, what you feed your mind on a regular basis. Most of us knowingly, intentionally accommodate evil into our, into our minds and even into our hearts. I want you to think about the, what you rehearse in your mind for people who have hurt you, how you wish they were dead, how you wish you could get back at them, how, what you would do one day if you had a chance to really tell your boss what you think of him. These things that we rehearse in our minds, we accommodate evil Intentionally, we give it a space. And Paul says, no, no, no. You are a new person. Your identity is in Christ. You have been saved. You have been forgiven when you didn't deserve it. So now put those things to death. That's an action item. It, it requires a degree of effort. But over time, your goodness will be increased because there's less evil. There's just less evil attached to your life, right? So when I think about those in our church, there are many people in our church who have this virtue of goodness. You know, my observation would be that they just simply lack a lot of the normal evil that we take for granted in people, the, the normal selfishness, the normal kind of resentment, uh, the, the, the normal uh, unwillingness to celebrate other people's gifts because it makes you insecure. Like, I mean, this is the the virtue of goodness. There's some evil that's just lacking in their lives. And so when you're with them, uh, they, they're curiously optimistic people. Uh, they're not in a rush. They're quick to listen, slow to speak. They ask very good questions. And then they listen so attentively that you're led to believe that the answer that you're about to give is going to answer the most meaningful question that they've been wrestling with for weeks. You ever be with people like that? 
how are you? Right? I mean, they, they really want to know. What do you think about this? And, and so on. These people uh, who bear this virtue of goodness, they, they have very few secrets, no hidden agendas. They always seem quite content with what they have. Their words are seasoned with grace. They tend to have a deep sense of joy, and they are truthful, sometimes to a degree that makes you uncomfortable. Those who demonstrate this virtue of goodness are those who serve. They think nothing of it. They, that's just their life. They sacrifice, they give generously, they constantly consider the needs of others before themselves, and they're fine if you never find out anything that they're doing. They have no, no motivation to tell you. They, they, you kind of have to pull it out of them. They just don't brag about their goodness because they're not being good to be acknowledged. They're being good because it's becoming their nature to be good, to do what is right, because they're living their life like Jesus would live their life if he lived their story. I was doing a funeral yesterday for a, a man, an elder of the man in our church. He passed away recently, John, uh, John Hughes, good, good man. And uh, his family chose to do a very small, very private uh, graveside service. So we had time to just sit around in the chairs and talk about him. And from the grandchildren to the daughters and so on, the sons-in-laws, they were just sharing about his goodness. They went on, they just, uh, they, he was generous, he was wise, selfless, helpful, always thinking about the needs of others. He was such a good man. He made decisions for his family and those uh, where he worked because it was the right thing to do no matter the cost. And so finally, after about 25 minutes of them sharing the virtues of this man, his daughter Rhonda, who was just trying to put it into words, you can see she was like, I just, Dad just so reminded me of Jesus. You could just see Jesus in him. That, in a nutshell, is the virtue of goodness. You will remind people of Jesus. So I have a question for you. This would be a great conversation uh, starter for lunch today. If you were die, uh, to die tomorrow, what would people say about you? And would anybody... Would anybody stand up and say, she just reminded me of Jesus. I could just see Jesus in him. Because that obviously would be like the greatest compliment you could ever receive, and it really is the end of every Christian life, that people would simply look to us, and through the goodness that is in us, they see Jesus, and they give glory to God. All right, let's turn our attention now to the virtue of kindness. If goodness can be thought of as who God is, that's what Jesus said, only God is good, uh, then kindness might be thought of as how God is towards us, right? Whereas God's goodness is captured in the perfect justice of his law. God's kindness is captured in his mercy towards us in Christ. Such is why for the Christian, it truly is uh, the fact that God's goodness and his kindness are inextricably woven together. We never really separate these two things, and the Bible really never separates them. They're always woven together. Look at Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Don't you love that? You know, God could have turned his face and justifiably abandoned us. He could have allowed us to remain separated from him as, as spiritual orphans, but he chose to adopt us. He chose to bring us into his family at the expense of his only natural born son, Jesus of Nazareth, right? Jesus said, uh, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's kindness. When we read the Bible, we always see goodness and kindness interwound. And, and Titus 3, 4, 7 is one of the great examples of that. Let, look at this scripture. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God See how he put those things together. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Doesn't that just make you love God? 
his goodness and loving kindness came to us in Jesus Christ that we would inherit, that we would be his children, that we would be heirs. Now, we can best understand what something is by identifying what it is not. We, we understand good better when we understand the opposite is evil. The opposite of kindness, I would call justifiable indifference. The opposite of kindness, I, I didn't even read this anywhere, so I may be wrong, but I'm just saying this is the way it looks to me, is justifiable indifference. Let's just take a very practical example on a human level, something most of us can relate with. Let's just say that it's trash day in your neighborhood. How many of you know that's like the greatest day of the week, right? <laughs> I mean, there's just something purging about trash day. And uh, so you, you're getting up for work. It's early in the morning. You're walking out there to get in your car to go to work. Uh, you got your nice clothes on. You got a meeting you got to get to. And you realize as you walk out that last night was very windy and the neighbors that live next to you, you know, they're the neighbors who their trash is so high that they can't even close the lid. They, they may be called the West family. Uh, <laughs> that, that this family, uh, their trash can got blown over in that little gust that came last night and now there is trash all over the street, all over your yard. And these particular neighbors, you really don't like them a lot. I mean, they can be very rude. And so now you're left with a decision, right? You have this justifiable indifference, which is to say, that's not my problem. It's not my trash. They should have known better. They should have figured out how to strap that lid on there. They should have propped it up or something. I mean, it's not my job to clean up their trash. I'm late for work. I got my nice clothes on. I am justifiably indifferent to this situation. But Christian kindness will say, yeah, they don't deserve, they don't deserve me picking up their trash. There's nothing deserving about that, and they probably won't even appreciate it. But because Jesus loved me, just as Jesus sacrificed his life for me, I am to love and show kindness to others. And so you spend the next 10, 15 minutes cleaning up the trash, you make sure that the lid is now securely attached. And as you drive off, you realize that your neighbors will likely never know what you did. And your Christian virtue of goodness and kindness demands that you don't tell them what you did because then they would be in your debt. And the virtue of Christian kindness and goodness can never leave people in your debt. Kindness is an act of mercy. Love and consideration and care for those who are not necessarily deserving. It is an expression of the goodness that is in you, rooted in Christ. Kindness is not politeness. Kindness is not tolerance. Kindness is not simply the absence of malice. Kindness is intentional. It is generous. It is more than expected. It is an expression of thoughtfulness, sacrifice, and care for another person. And it says in no uncertain terms, you are loved more than you know and more than you deserve. That is exactly what we receive from the kindness of God to us in Jesus Christ. That's what we exhibit when we exhibit the virtue of kindness to others. Uh, many of you know my friend and fellow church member, Dave Ellis. I'm going to pick on Dave for a minute because uh, he is an example of kindness in my life. Uh, Dave prays for me at 4 a.m. just about every morning of every week. He prays for other people too. But I know that he prays for me at 4 a.m. every morning because he texts me every once in a while at 4 a.m. to simply say, Jim, here's how I'm praying for you today. Here's the scripture I'm praying over for you today. And I mean, I'm telling you, it just undoes me that, that somebody would would be thinking of me and praying for me, praying for my family at 4 a.m. in the morning. Now, here's something I can tell you is that I do not get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and pray for Dave. Uh, and I don't feel like he expects me to. Dave's kindness towards me is an expression of the love that he has in his heart for people. I happen to be one of those people who has the honor of being loved and prayed for by this gracious son of God. Dave's kindness expects nothing in return. His his kindness towards me is an expression of the unmerited love and grace of Jesus Christ that has taken root in his life. And his kindness towards me leads me to give glory to God and thanks to God because I know that Dave is Dave and Dave is doing what he's doing out of the great grace and love of Jesus Christ that has changed him and led him to be this man who is so kind, so kind to me and so many others. Many of us probably have... Uh, 
stories of unmerited kindness. I mean, if you're part of a Christian church, if you're part of a Christian community, you should have some of these stories. You know, those times when people showed up with a meal or a visit, there was maybe anonymous check when, when your financial needs were discovered. Perhaps, you know, somebody shoveled your driveway or mowed your yard when you couldn't get out and do it. Maybe it was a, a note with words that encouraged you or uh, somebody who took the initiative to forgive you when you really didn't deserve to be forgiven. You'll recognize the virtue of Christian kindness. How? Just because it'll remind you of Jesus. It'll remind you of the way that Jesus loved us. That's the picture of Christian kindness. Now, let's quickly consider the cultural confusion about goodness and kindness uh, in the world in which we live. You know, there was a time uh, in Christian uh, America, if you will, uh, maybe over 100 years ago, but there was a French philosopher who came and said, the genius of America is its goodness. And if it ever loses its goodness, it will lose it's genius. It will lose what is unique and special about this country. There was such a strong commitment towards goodness. And, uh, you know, I mean, it got twisted, and people could be very moralistic and very, you know, but th- in its heart, goodness was a very high value for our country. But what, as I was reflecting upon it uh, this week, I was just, like, when was the last time I actually heard this value of goodness being promoted in our country? It's really kind of a lost thing. And one of the reasons is because goodness appeals to Uh, a standard by which we can determine good and evil, right and wrong, this kind of absolute standard. And our country has become very averse to any such objective standard. So goodness has become a very watered down, relativistic, you know, what's good for me might not be good for you. Let's just all do our own good, our own personal good. It's very watered down, very relativistic. But what you find also uh, with this virtue of goodness is that we kind of default back into uh, where most of the world is, and that is that we should really be more good than we are bad. That's a very hard thing to understand how we're doing, right? Because good is so wishy-washy, we really don't know what good is anymore. Uh, Everyone can kind of make up their own good. This is why now people just say, well, I'm just being true to myself, as though somehow that accomplishes goodness, right? Because you're, you're now the standard, you're the judge and jury of your own goodness. So without God, There really is no good. Our cultural religion that is now supported by our state is called secular humanism. That's all in our courts and schools and so on. And within the language of secular humanism, they literally say we will achieve good without God. You won't. (laughs) You won't really even be able to know how to talk about it. And so we don't. Our culture really doesn't talk about goodness very much anymore. However, kindness, kindness is a virtue that our culture embraces and promotes. Kindness, I guarantee you, is in the mission statement or in the values of every local elementary school and all of our schools. Uh, They're actually very much trying to teach kindness as some version of inclusion and tolerance and so on. Kindness is a huge deal in our culture. You hear about it all the time. And it's not because we're good at it. It's because we so desperately need it. You know, our culture has never been so fractured and hostile as it is right now, and so consequent, well, maybe the Civil War. That was pretty fractured and hostile. Uh, but, but generally speaking, uh, we're begging for kindness. We're begging for kindness. We're begging for this, this lack of enmity and anger and hostility, and so this cultural uh, emphasis on kindness is very, very common now. The question that I have is, can kindness exist without goodness? Can kindness exist without goodness? And what I would say is I think kindness is compromised without goodness. Kindness without goodness is niceness. How many of you know the difference between niceness and kindness, right? Niceness is I'm going to smile, I'm going to be courteous and polite and nice to you, but I don't really care for you, right? I, I, it's really about my behavior and the way that I'm just presenting myself in our conversation, in the meeting that we're in, but there's really no kindness because kindness is rooted in goodness and genuine love and concern for another person. Niceness is quite superficial and conflict avoidant. Kindness will actually go further than niceness because it's willing to risk offense, it's willing to do what is right and good even at personal expense and even at risking offense to another person. So that kind of kindness uh, goes much deeper than niceness. Now, this is why I just want to say authentic Jesus followers are desperately needed in our culture. 
the Christian should be the person in the room, in the school, in the workplace, in your neighborhood, who best exemplifies and models the beautiful marriage of goodness and kindness. Why? Because our goodness is rooted in the character of God, and our kindness is rooted in the mercy of Jesus on a cross. And people should see that in us, both goodness and kindness, constantly lifted up, shining like a light in the darkness of a hurting culture that's very confused about goodness and really has kind of just resigned itself to niceness but lacks genuine kindness. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we call ourselves the church, and yet we fail to show people both goodness and kindness, if we all talk about goodness and morality and we lack kindness, if we all kind of fall into the kindness of our culture that lacks any semblance of goodness, then we misrepresent the God that we say that we believe in. It does great damage to our witness. If you are just listening to this message and you're like, man, I really stink in the virtues of goodness and kindness. I am a Christian. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But so here's, this is where we always come back to. Then we need to start practicing some different things. So let's just close by looking at how do we cultivate these virtues of goodness and kindness as Christians in our lives? Well, always remember, I mean, the the development of Christian virtue always begins with our conversion, with our admitting our sin, receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and asking the Holy Spirit to come and take residence and mastery of our life. We can't do this without him. But then there are certain things we must do. We must participate, train, practice in our lives, and that's all throughout the scriptures. So let's talk about goodness. How do we cultivate goodness? We cultivate goodness by practicing the character of God practice the character of God. We can discover the character of God by looking at Jesus and reading scriptures and we see who he is and how he is and we can practice his character in our thoughts, deeds, and speech. The more we dwell upon who God is and how he is, the more we must then also put to death the sinful habits as we read in Colossians 3. This is no easy task. Putting old habits to death is difficult, but we must ruthlessly eliminate intentional evil from our lives. You'll know intentional evil for your lives as you dwell upon the character of God and then you look at what you do. Most of us accommodate a level of intentional evil every single day. And unless we're really fixed upon the character of God, we really hardly even notice it. It's what we listen to. It's what we watch. It's what we read. It's the thoughts that we entertain in our mind. It is that constant reveling on on revenge, on forgiveness, resentment. We intentionally do these things. We have intentional evil in our lives. Think about the intentional evil we put into our body, right? I mean, if we're getting drunk, if we're getting stoned, if we're doing things that, that compromise the, the temple of God, our sexual habits, there's just things that we do that are, are cultivating evil in our lives that are quite intentional. We may try to, you know, tip the scales towards good by doing some good deeds, but we're accommodating a lot of evil in our lives. We'll never really develop the virtue of goodness if we continue to accommodate intentional evil in our lives. That's why Paul says, put it to death. Put it to death. Cultivate goodness by ruthlessly eliminating the infusion of evil into our bodies, hearts, and minds. Paul writes in Philippians 4, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So what we think and what we practice trains us towards goodness or it trains us towards evil. So that's just very practical. We must be intentional about practicing what is good. You know, most of us think uh, over time, I'll just magically somehow become good. You, You actually need to start practicing some good, right? This is where you'll be amazed. Uh, C.S. Lewis writes about this a lot in Mere Christianity. You'll feel loving towards somebody if you'll just begin acting loving towards them. If you act hostile towards them, you'll increasingly feel hostile towards them, right? So our feelings actually follow our behavior. And so uh, we just make a commitment to start acting in a way that is good. We make a commitment to serve uh, we're we're going to go show up at schools on Tuesdays and read with second graders who are struggling to get to a, you know, a, a high left reading level. Uh, we have dozens of people who just practice goodness by going into schools and mentoring kids. We practice goodness by volunteering to serve in the church and ministries. We volunteer uh, to 
give up something that's very meaningful to us. We give up our money. We give up something valuable to help people who are in great need. Probably for most of us, the most valuable thing we could give up is our time. But we make a commitment and we begin to practice goodness. And as you practice goodness, you will become more good. You'll, it'll become more normal for you to have this kind of goodness in your life. You know, Jesus said this very clearly in Matthew 7, 24, 25. Here's what he said. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. This foundation on the rock is not built upon what you believe. It is built upon what you practice, okay? So if the virtues of goodness and kindness are lacking in your life, it's because you're not practicing what Jesus said. This is a very simple prescription. Go and read what he said. Spend time in the Gospels and then practice what he said. Practice turning the other cheek. Practice pray for your enemy. Practice forgiveness for those who have hurt you. Practice what he said and you will be building this foundation on the rock. And that will be just a stream of goodness that will bear fruit in your life. But we must practice, right? Now, let's talk about kindness. How do we cultivate kindness? We cultivate kindness by treating people the way that Jesus treated us. Here's what he said in John 13, 34. Just as I have loved you, so you also are to love one another. I love these two words, just as. I heard an African-American pastor one time at a conference give an entire message on just as. It was one of the best messages I ever heard, and I've never forgotten it. This is often said in scriptures. Just as, just as. I have loved you, so you should love others. Just as I have forgiven you, so you should forgive others. Just as I have served you, you should serve others. Jesus is constantly saying this. If you really want to cultivate the virtue of kindness in your life, continue to apply these two words to every situation, to every day, just as. And if you don't know how God loved you and how Jesus served you and how he sacrificed for you and how he forgave you, once again, meditate upon the Gospels. But this will be our training ground. How are you responding to this person? How are you responding to the situation? What, what are you doing with this opportunity to bless and show kindness? Begin with those two words, just as. Just as. Church, let me tell you something. The world desperately needs Jesus followers to rise up in families, in communities, in schools with these virtues of goodness and kindness. Goodness and kindness will be beautifully received, even if, if the message behind it is not. The world is desperately longing for goodness and kindness. It is what Jesus saved you to be. It is what you can become. But it is part of the life of the disciple to go through this metamorphosis through what we believe to be true, what we practice, and eventually the virtues of Christ in us. May it be true, instead of each person here, when we are gone, Ah, they just reminded me so much of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you modeled for us and you showed us in very tangible and practical ways what we are to become. We are to become little Christs who think like you, who practice like you, and who bear your virtues. And not for our glory, but for yours even when it comes at our own expense, that we might bring peace and blessing and hope and healing to our hurting culture. So I pray, Father, that you would give us a very clear picture of where to start, that we would know that ultimately the greatest good would be that people would remember that we reminded them of Jesus, that they saw Christ in us. Lord, many of us are struggling with the evil that is in our lives that has taken root, that seems almost impossible to overcome. We pray for the freedom that comes from the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would prompt us that we would begin to take just even small steps to practice what you taught us, that we would have this foundation built upon a rock that would withstand the storms of life, that would endure over time, that would leave a lasting legacy of hope for those that you've put us on earth to influence. May this church rise up to be the light of Christ in a hurting culture, bearing the virtues of goodness and kindness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.